Welcome again to our Tales and Treasures program. Tonight we are happy to have Hubie Norton as our speaker. Uh, Hubie is a resident of Essex and has done much research over the years on all parts of history of Essex and Essex Junction. And tonight he's going to tell us more about the village of Essex Center. Hubie. <laughs> Well, with all due respect to Shakespeare, you know, to be or not to be, the village, Essex yeah. Center, the village. So, Essex Center, where is Essex Center? Uh, we're in it. It's right here. Uh, it's the center of Essex. Uh, and initially, uh, as the, the uh, town was being settled, the, uh, the town fathers said, we need to have an area in the center of the town that is going to be easily accessible for everyone within the town, weren't cars then, where we can have our social things uh, like our churches, we can have our commerce, we can have our cemetery, we can have our common. So they charged uh, some folks to find the actual center of Essex, which the, the exact center, if you will, this map is a little hazier, but this is the 1856 Beers Atlas map with lines drawn diagonally and they cross right up here, right about the junction of Chapin Road and Towers Road, and that was the geographic center, basically, of Essex. Let's establish the center. Well, it's kind of wet out there, if you've ever been out there. So they said, let's get a little bit further south, and here we are in Essex Center. And this is where uh, the initial, uh, again, the, the commerce area, the churches, the, uh, the, the town hall, which this was, of course, built later, but this is where they had meetings. Uh, the village of Essex Center they used to have their meetings here. The town of Essex used to have their, their uh, town meetings in this hall. But anyway, so a lot of these, these this uh, map here has these uh, place names on them. There's Page's Corners, there's Butler's Corners, here's Essex Junction. Essex Junction wasn't a formal municipality until the late 1890s. This is an 1856 map. Here's Essex Center. There was a post office in Essex Center. These are place names. They're not municipality uh, definite by definition. So how did Essex Center come to be? Well, there was a bunch of folks back in 1949 or probably a little earlier decided that they, they needed to have some potable water. That was their primary goal, to have potable water. They, they were living on wells and cisterns and, and springs uh, not always reliable. Uh, also, a very important part was to have uh, fire protection. They get fire hydrants in, your fire insurance rates go down and so on. <clears throat> so, a bunch of people got together, got their legislator uh, to put in a bill. And in 1949, uh, there was a bill that was uh, enacted. That portion of the old school district number six in the town of Essex, which was this area right around here, uh, composed of the real estate and property owned by the following named parties, Robert and Lorraine Guyette, Margaret Brown and Carl B. Platka, Mabel B. Downer, Essex Classical Institute, M. Alvera Pratt, etc., etc. There are about 70 names of properties that were described in the charter and that defined the boundaries of the village of Essex Center. And that act, Act 302, was approved in April 30th, 1949. And as I had showed the slides a little bit out of order here, but had the first meeting, if we note again, that's April 27th, April 30th, they had their meeting, of course, before the charter, which is what you do, all right, because you have to show the legislature that you want to have a charter. And there were a whole 27 folks in favor and 15 opposed to having the charter. Anyway, that was enough for the legislature, so they went ahead and they approved the charter. This is the approximate extent of the village of Essex Center in 1948, about a year before uh, 1949, obviously. And at that time, uh, you can see the, the, the dots here, there were about 72 houses or so within that area that was to become defined as the village of Essex Center. Uh, you note here, uh, right here, this is the, this is the line of the, of the railroad, which in 1948 was no longer here, but that's the old railroad bed, and then you can see it coming uh, across here as well. In 
1949, the, <coughs> uh, the uh, highway department has uh, different classifications for roads uh, that are state roads that are within a municipality. Uh, so this is one of their, their earliest maps uh, that uh, this uh, has some 1953 penciled in notes and there's a note here that uh, somebody from the highway department met with one of the village trustees uh, to talk about exactly where was the boundary. Uh, and like I, like I noted, you know, this was defined by these properties. Well, unless you do a detailed, in-depth uh, property research, it was difficult to really define exactly what the boundaries were. This is a 1962 uh, Essex Center area, uh, aerial photo, obviously. And this, we'll get into this a little bit more, but th this was uh, uh, really kind of the start of things to come. Uh, you'll notice right here, this is uh, the Levine Drive, uh, uh, Perry, Perry, Perry Drive, Levine Road development that's ongoing. They're building houses in here. Here's the Sunset Drive area. These two areas were the first two areas where there were uh, uh, starting to have developments, if you will. <coughs> Pinewood Manor was in here, nothing going on there. Uh, Foster Road, there's hardly anything on, going on there. Nothing in the Lomel area. Uh, Flanders development, nothing, you know, th this, this is 1962. Think about that a little bit. <laughs> it, it doesn't, for some of us, doesn't seem all that long ago, but anyway. So, they had their first village meeting. Uh, and these are the folks that were voted in as the village officers. Ray Nichols, some of these names uh, may sound familiar. Uh, Ray Nichols, D. Buxby, Alvin Doobie, Stanley Fisk, Lester Guyette, Will Wool, R.S. Tower, C.A. Booth, and then these were the auditors. Ethel Bixby, Alice Fisk, Gladys B. Stockwell. A lot of those folks remained as trustees on the board for a long, long time. One of the, the uh, it was interesting that this is not old history necessarily, but uh, finding information about the village of Essex Center uh, was not quite as easy as I expected. Uh, I did find in the suburban list, find, I finally found an article where they started mentioning a little bit about, well, we were gonna have a water district, but there wasn't a lot. And then at one point it said, uh, uh, A.W. Hoig, uh, who was an engineering and surveying firm in Burlington, was doing uh, the surveying and engineering and layout of the water system. Googled UVM Special Collections, got a box full of stuff that was donated by uh, A.W. Hoig. Uh, and, his, and I believe, uh, uh, I'm not sure Scott may know the, who took over uh, A.W. Hoig's business, but uh, whether it was, uh, anyway, they, this, there was, a, there was a, a, a lot of stuff there, and this was one of the items. Uh, they did not only the, in, you know, they did the engineering and the surveying, but they also helped to uh, organize some of the financial information, and this is uh, the, the basic, the, the initial blush of what was gonna be required. They were gonna need about 70,000 bucks, need to get bonded, you know, you don't make a water district uh, out of nothing, you gotta have some money, uh, and this, this was their expectation by the end of year 10, uh, they were gonna have to get about $6,000 of, of revenue in order to sustain the payments on the bond. Uh, and then uh, here in 1970, their actual revenue was up to $20,000. Uh, remember 1962, uh, you know, there was a, something starting a little bit. Here's eight years later, there's a lot more going on. So this was uh, what was uh, going to be happening, how they were going to spend all that money. Uh, they're going to build a storage basin for 5,000 bucks, pump house and pump. Stand pipe and base, stand pipe and base, think water tower. Uh, 15 fire hydrants, of course, that was an important part of this. Engineering, of course, the piping, that was, of course, the biggest expense. And then always got a contingency other expenses, $69,000. It's not completely clear to me, and I probably could have engaged a lawyer, but at some point, uh, before they got things finally rolling, in 1951, they went back to the legislature, and, uh, and this was an act to amend certain sections, 1820 and 22, of that original charter. 
And I believe it just had something to do with the way the finances were set up as far as their bonding authority and whatever. But this charter, uh, the original charter and, and this one that was tuned up a little bit, uh, this gave, the, this was not just a water district, this village had all of the municipal powers of any village. They could have a fire department, a police department, planning commission, all of these things, tunnel vision. It came up more than once, water district, that's all we're really interested in. Initially, later on, there was a little more uh, thought about wanting to expand some, but water district. And <clears throat> so this was approved in uh, 1951. Uh, and it happens that in that same session of the legislature, uh, there was actually an amendment made to the, the uh, charter of Essex Junction. And if you look at the record, the Essex Junction charter was, was uh, uh, amended many, many times as they, they uh, changed things around. And then, of course, that's all gone. Special meeting in May 31st, 1951, to see if the qualified legal voters of said village will vote to construct a water system including reservoir, pipelines, connections, the pertinence, purchase and acquire all real estate easements, rights of way and personal property necessary, therefore, and to issue bonds not to exceed 60,000. So this was where they're asking the voters, uh, are we really going to do this? They got, had the groundwork laid, they've got the design, they've got the charter. This was what they wanted to build, a million gallon reservoir. Uh, a pump that would handle 250 gallons per minute, 14,000 feet of pipe, and a 60,000 gallon storage tank. Now that's some information that I uh, got out of the suburban list uh, in 1951. They're pretty excited here in Essex Center. This is some things out of the suburban list again. After many months of preliminary work, construction of a new, new fire, see fire first, and water system is being started and it is anticipated by late fall the system will be in operation. Great expectations. Where was that million gallon reservoir? One of the best kept secrets of Essex Center. You know where Founders Road is? Where there's a bus garage on Founders Road? There's a little road that goes down beside the bus garage. You go down behind there and there is this pond right here. This actually is the second pond. The first pond uh, was designed and built. This, this area was all wooded and they, they purchased the land that was cleared. The, the dam, was, dam and pond was designed by Hoy. They built the first pond, which is actually behind here. Uh, and then later on, they built a second pond because they needed additional uh, reservoir. This pond, uh, is still in use. As a matter of fact, uh, initially, the, the initial plan was to drill wells in order to get the water supply. And they had some technical folks come in and do some testing, and they could not uh, secure enough water supply by drilling wells. And, and someone discovered these springs down behind where the bus garage is now. They built a weir, did measurements and so on. Hey, we got good capacity. And it's amazing how much water flows through that pond. It's so good that what goes on here is the water level has been lowered here. You can see where it's up higher here. What's going on here is the Fish and Game Department in conjunction with the, the uh, Orleans Rod and Gun Club raised fish in this pond and Every year, they, they, put, they put them in in the spring, they feed them through the, the summer and winter, and then the following spring, they harvest them. And these are uh, fishing game employees. They've got a bucket brigade hauling fish out of the, they bring a net across the pond to gather all the fish in one end, bucket brigade up, and they dump them into a bin here, and then <coughs> net them out. These things are, they're, you know, they're six, eight inches long, nine inches long fish, and they take them up to the Willoughby River. I asked the biologist, I says, what in the world are you doing coming down to Essex, Vermont to raise fish? You couldn't find anything in the Northeast Kingdom? With, you know, and said, no, this pond was one of the best they could find as far as reliability of continuous water source, didn't dry up in the summer and so on. So it says something about the, the, uh, the viability and, and how good that water supply was. 
So here they are, you know, and they load them in the tank trucks and haul them up to Willoughby. Now, so that's the, that's the reservoir. Now the water tank. Now, how many of you remember this water tank here? This water tank sat right over here where the railroad used to cross. If you go out 128 towards uh, Westford, just across from the school, the, the railroad track crossed right there and there's a trailer that sits on the railroad bed there now. Well, this water tank sat right there. And this water tank came from Eli, Vermont, which is uh, fairly. It was an old water tank for the railroad. <clears throat> they had some problems. Initially, they were looking to get a, have a water tank fashion. This was only about a 60,000 gallon water tank. They wanted one much larger. <clears throat> and, excuse me, they wanted a 60,000. This is only about 20, 25,000, something like that, much smaller. They had contacted uh, an outfit in western New York to build a, a, a tank for them, but it wasn't working out. It was, gonna, it was gonna take too long to ship, to make, it wasn't gonna come in time. They were anxious, somehow they got this deal. 300 bucks for the tank, $3,000 to Vermont Structural Steel. They disassembled it, brought it over here, and that became the water tank. That provided the head for the, uh, for the water system. Well, are we gonna move on here or not? So in 1951, the plans for the whole system were approved by the village. Uh, 1951, Hoyd was doing the supervision for the construction and they had, they had some questions about, well, were things being done quite right? But the point is that they were, they were working late into the winter trying to get the system going. Remember, they wanted to have it, it was gonna be operational by the fall of 51. Well, anyway, it wasn't until May 1952 that Mr. Wool, he became the first patron. He was one of the trustees and he happens to live at Wool Crossing, okay, where the, where the railroad cross up on Route 15 is you head towards Essex Junction. That old brick house they just tore down here a couple weeks ago, that was Wool's house. He happened to be right at the extent of the, of the water district, so it made sense to have him be one of the first people. If it worked for him, it's gonna work for everybody as far as the head and pressure and whatever. So, but it wasn't until the end of August, in August 52 that things were complete. They were so excited. It's amazing what magic our water system is working. Oh, Merlin the magician couldn't have done more. Boy, this, this is wonderful. Steady issue. Initially, 55 customers. 1950s to 60s, you see they were adding just a couple customers a year. In 1963, they had 120. They bet a little more than double. So, very limited information I could find for the village prior to 1968. There was no village office, didn't have a telephone. There was, there were, they, they did all of their work from home. Uh, uh, any reports, records, anything was, was kept by the individual trustees, the treasurer and president, the meter readers, whatever. Um, so <clears throat> the only people that were paid uh, any wage were the meter reader, uh, the treasurer and the clerk. Very modest wages were paid. Um, and then, uh, <clears throat> you'll see later, they, they really didn't have any other employees. And these are really part-time people. Because uh, you only need to read meters, you know, once a year or whatever. And they would usually get some high school student to do that. Let's have growth. Really getting excited here. Village ambitious to grow and welcome new residents. But... They don't want anybody that's going to be a charge to the town. Too many kids don't charge the school system or whatever. So they wanted to make it easy going. And then in 1957, what happened? What, what, what was it? Uh, <laughs> IBM. IBM. These numbers are a little hard to see maybe, but United States Census information. This line is the Essex town that includes the village of Essex Junction. Here's the village. Here's the town outside the village. Okay, not, this is not necessarily the village of Essex Center, but it's the town outside the village. 57 to 60, 
80% growth in the whole town. 94% growth in Essex Junction, 47% in the town. 60 to 70. Village is tailing off 54.4%, pretty good growth still. Uh, excuse me, the village I is 21%. Town outside the village, 153% growth. Blowing the socks off this water district. And things kept going uh, fairly well here, uh, even from 70 to 80. This is the, the accounting. Again, like I said, I d couldn't find much information prior to 1968. But after 68, there was better, better uh, information. Uh, so from 64 to 68, they were averaging about 77 new accounts per year. Think about it, 77 new accounts a year in that time frame. See here, uh, 1969, they added 54, then 51, 35, 43, 9, starts tailing off a little bit. Here's their receipts uh, and their, their uh, disbursements, etc. And they ran a pretty tight ship. They, uh, uh, they kept a pretty good balanced budget. They didn't, have, they didn't go a lot in the hole. Here's that bond uh, right here, of course, that uh, they needed to, because of this expansion, they needed to, to uh, have a, well, I, I'm, not, I'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit. But anyway, 1960, there are 10 housing developments going on. They were getting infill along Route 15 and Sand Hill Road, Foster Road, and there were over 500 living units added in that time frame. The water system was stressed. They were having problems with some chem contamination, uh, cladiness. You know, they, they actually suspended connections for some of the new houses being built for a time because they didn't feel they could handle it. They needed to, they, they dredged the reservoir in order to get more capacity. Act 250 that you hear uh, frequently talked about is, is considered the, you know, the seminal environmental law. And the real genesis of that act was because of all the ski growth industry, is primarily in Southern Vermont, where they're building houses every place they shouldn't have been and putting in septic systems that were polluting the rivers and, and making these towns add more fire engines and police departments. It was just, they were stressing the communities really big time. That in, uh, really triggered Act 7, Act uh, 250. Uh, and meanwhile, the village has it kind of a little bit under the radar, but I think if anybody was doing uh, uh, an analysis or a study, uh, Essex, the, the, this village of Essex Center would be an excellent case study for uh, the, the kinds of impacts that Act 250 was trying to uh, mitigate. To be and or not to be. Well, we're struck, you know, this is get, you know, we wanted a water system. Should we merge? There was merger talk going on back then. Uh, and should we merge? Should we separate? Uh, what sewer? We need, maybe we need a sewer system here. How about a fire department? Planning commission. We need a plan. Police. Uh, so uh, how about a town plan? Well, there is a town plan. Do we need a separate town plan for the village of Essex Center? These questions kept cropping up. Focus kept being water. We want to stay a water district, you know. That was, that was the driving uh, force, and there was, there was uh, little uh, ambition to want to wanna try to expand beyond that. So, you know, they had to make some decisions. In 1968, they, they uh, floated another $100,000 bond issue to build the second pond. That was the, the pond where I was showing you where they're taking the fish out. That was actually the second pond they built. Uh, uh, extend the line up Bixby Hill and put a new water tank on Bixby Hill. That apparently was part of the original plan was to have the water tank on top of Bixby Hill and the water line extending up there. Well, again, they ran into that problem uh, with not being able to skewer a water tank, so they took, a, they took the shortcut and used the old railroad tank to get them to this point. But now they, they, needed, to, they needed to go bigger. So they did that. Uh, they built that water tank, they extended the line up there, they made the reservoir bigger. This is a 1915 aerial photo of, for the original uh, Village of Isaac Center. Now, uh, this actually goes beyond, uh, the, the original Village of Essex Center uh, did end about here, which is uh, about opposite uh, Lamel's Lumberyard. It only came down to the cemetery, right about here as far as it came down Sand Hill Road. And again, we talked about 
out here to Will Wool's place on Route 15, and it only went just about to the railroad depot here on Towers Road, and just a little bit past the academy uh, on 128. So this, this area is a little bit larger than uh, what the original village of Essex Center was. And in 1968, uh, they said, wait a minute, <laughs> we got this development, we got Pinewood Manor, we got all these, these places, they want water. So they actually did a survey. This dotted line here represents the new boundary. The red line here represents the original Essex Center boundary. So they more than, uh, uh, probably more than doubled the area of Essex Center. Uh, and this was a surveyed map. Uh, and I think it was done by Gordy Harlow, I think. Uh, so there are some actual dimensions on this and uh, uh, that clearly defines what the boundaries of uh, the, the, the new boundaries for the village of Essex Center are. And this map uh, really does show uh, more of what that expanded area is. So you can see it now includes like the Margaret Street, LaSalle Street area down here, uh, gets out here to, to uh, 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 doesn't, yeah, show, circle drive, I think Circle Drive would be included here. Of course, the Lamel development. Uh, didn't, didn't go out here very much. Of course, this was all later, uh, Meadows Edge. Uh, but it did pick up uh, the initial parts of the Flanders development in here. Uh, and of course, Sunset Drive is here. And, and then good old Birchwood Manor. Uh, I said, did I say Pinewood Manor before? I might, I, I'm yeah. always confused there. I get, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> Birchwood Manor, uh, yeah, a lot of infill there. And, and uh, of course, Foster Road, a lot going on there. And uh, you can see right here, that is where the reservoir is. This is Founders Road, and there's the bus garage, and right down here, that is the reservoir area. Hans Klunder, anyone recognize the name Hans Klunder? Mm -hmm. uh, he was a, a consultant that was hired by the town of Essex uh, to develop a town plan. Uh, he, I think he was from uh, Hanover, New Hampshire area. Uh, anyway, and uh, one of his, his, it was for the whole town, but he had a plan about wanting to establish uh, an area to be uh, with administrative facilities, shopping service, yada, yada, cultural right here. Actually more out to where they originally put the, the center of, of uh, Essex. Uh, he had some plans for changing roads around and so on and, and to, to uh, focus this area as the growth segment. He also, Hans Klinger may be, may be better known for being the originator of, of the idea of a Cirque Highway uh, that was going to go around the five corners and originally really uh, only went about, started around about Athens Drive and through the old brickyard and so on. And as things grew, it kept moving further out, further out than what we have now. But at any rate, so here we go. They're talking about it and they want to have a planning commission. Now, uh, 96 said yes, 53 opposed, but it never happened. So again, system is stressed. Trustees are saying, you know, our, our, you know, our really our water supply, it, we, our source is, is, is not going to be, be sustainable. Uh, so they're looking for other places. Uh, and meanwhile, the village of Essex Junction, they'd already moved on to uh, Indian Brook because Saxons Hill was not being able to supply their needs. Uh, so, uh, and the town of Essex, they were actually approached the village of Essex Center and were proposing to take over the system. 1973, Champlain Water District, they extended their line out here to Essex Center. They uh, uh, fed the new water tank on the hill, uh, and that was the new water supply, uh, and they no longer needed the reservoir. They sold that, the reservoir and that chunk of land to the school. Uh, the old water tank hung around for a while, uh, and uh, there was a lot of angst about trying to get it removed, and it, they'd get somebody lined up and they wouldn't show up. But, but anyway, ultimately it did get removed in 1973. It didn't take long, I said, boy, we got, you know, we got a new water so supply. And uh, so uh, what's next? Here we are in 1976, they had two votes. 
the town wants to take over our water system. Do we want to have them take over our water system or not? Uh, and the votes were, were going to dispose of the assets consisting water system and the liabilities that $48,000 indebtedness uh, still there. Uh, 157 said, yeah, let's get rid of that. the town, take it over. 48 said no. That represented only about 15% of uh, the eligible voters of about 1,400 that, that currently lived in Essex Center at that time. Here's the actual votes uh, because there were two votes. Uh, and uh, the green ballot is uh, shall the village of Essex Center, uh, well, it's, it's, uh, we, we take them, it doesn't matter really. The first one, shall the village of Essex Center petition the Vermont legislature for introduction and adoption of a special bill terminating the charter of the village of Essex Center. So do we want to uh, uh, have the legislature uh, terminate our charter? That was one vote. The second vote was should the village uh, uh, turn over the water system to the town. Uh, and that slide that I had before there uh, with the yes and no, you know, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure what that yes and no was. I suspect it probably was similar for both votes. Simultaneously, in March 1976, at the annual town meeting, uh, excuse me, at the, annual, yeah, the, at the annual town meeting, shall the voters, you know, accept the village of Essex Center, water system and their indebtedness and so on. 513 said yes, 218 no. Uh, that, was, uh, that represented 10, 10, about 10% 10 of 7,000 people that were eligible to vote. So wow, get her down, boy. June 30th, 19th, the village of Essex Center water system is sold to the town of Essex in consideration $10 and other valuable services. Same date, the village of Essex Center conveyed five parcels of land. They had a couple parcels here or there uh, for various reasons. They conveyed all of those parcels of land to the town. One more step. The dissolution. Disso dissolution, the village of Essex, Essex Center is hereby dissolved. All property, records, and funds shall be vested in the town of Essex, and such town shall assume any indebtedness or obligation of the village. This was the repeal of Act 302, 1949, and then remember that amended uh, Act 276 in 1951. The Act to take effect upon passage. Wait a minute. This very sage senator from, I think it was Washington County, said, was the purpose of this, excuse me, I gotta do this. Was the purpose of this bill to actually dissolve the village or to dissolve the charter? If this bill itself dissolves Essex Center, I would like to change it because I have some very good friends in Essex Center and I would hate to see them washed down the brook. So, <laughs> lawyer talk. And he went on, the legislature is very powerful but there is a limit. So anyway, I don't think the words were ever changed, so. But we, did, we didn't get dissolved. Essex Center is, is still here, but the charter was dissolved. So April 20th, 1977, the village of Essex Center is no more, but Essex Center, the place forevermore. Any questions? Yeah, I got a question. Uh-oh. <laughs> so all the reservoirs, down off Boston Road and the tank was out here on yep. 28. So right. He must have had a pumping station. Or right. Yeah, as a matter of fact, boy, here's good street. This is this is really this is a terrible picture, okay? <laughs> but anyway, this is a, a picture of the plan that Hoig had for the pump house. Uh, and and this is actually it's one plan that shows how to build a pump house and it shows all the piping and the pump and whatever. And there are remnants, you really have to do some digging, of where that pump house was down by the pond. Uh, and so yes, indeed, there was a pump. And of course, that was outside the actual limits of the village of Essex Center at the time. Uh, but that's, that was all, as was, you know, uh, uh, the, the yeah, Essex Junction watershed, Allen Mount watershed, outside the village of Essex Junction. That's where they, you know, mo most towns, I say most towns, Many towns get their water from outside their own municipality. So, 
Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, you know, quite a ways away, uh, but they, have, they pump water up to this water tank. So. so slightly off the topic, but you mentioned Indian Brook Reservoir as a source for Essex Junction. And we know that Saxon Hill Forest was also the source. Right. What, do you know the time frame of both of those as to when they made the switch from Saxon Well, to that, I, I, don't, I don't know for sure. I know you did a piece on, on the, the, uh, the Saxon's Woods, the Saxon, Saxon Hill. Uh, so I, I don't know for sure, but I did find one piece uh, in the suburban list where uh, the ladies' aid club or some club had a speaker from Essex Junction, someone that was a member of the Essex Junction uh, Water Department, that said, well, we have enough uh, capacity in Saxon Woods to supply water to Essex Center if they would like it. Uh, it would have to be pumped, okay, and that was it. That was all it was said. It was like a two-liner. Never saw anything more about that. It, I was always a little curious about why uh, and or if the trustees or anyone had ever approached the village to see about getting one, because certainly there were those ponds out there and so on. So whether, uh, but for whatever reason, they, they went their own way uh, and uh, established their own water supply and so on. So. Yeah, Lord, yeah. You asked about, you told about gathering of the fish and those pitchers. When was that? Before it was our water source? Or oh, no, no, it's long, long, this was long after the, the water system was dissolved. And then they were getting it. Then they started using it, yeah. And they've been, I think, gosh, just, I think it's more than 20, 25 years they've been doing this. Yeah, I'm still amazed. They, you know, they couldn't find a place in the Northeast Kingdom to raise fish for the Willoughby River, and that's the Willoughby River. Any fisherman, you know, I mean, that's that's a big deal up there. So. They're not doing it now. Yes, sir. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That that picture was from, I think, uh, two years ago. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, that's it's not a big secret if anybody really wants to know uh, that. Usually they harvest the fish the weekend before the opening of trout season. And what they used to do is they'd get a bus load of like usually high school kids down there for their bucket brigades. Because uh, again, they'd lower the water in the pond and they put a, a, a net and they, and they wade through, get waders on, they, they move all the fish up to one end and then they have this bucket brigade hauling fish up over the bank. They have all these high school kids hauling fish. So I used to kind of be looking for the bus and I'd go down there and, and watch them harvest. So, uh, so yeah, no, it's still, uh, uh, I believe it's still continuing to do that each year. Just a side note, my father took me down there to the, I think it was the pump house, that's where the meter was, right? Well. He had to read that and um, so I went down there with him and he also went around the town to collect water bills. Yeah, that was one of the things, like I mentioned, there weren't any, uh, uh, I do have another, uh, another slide here. This, uh, John Hill was, was at least in the later years and, and probably for many of the years that the, the, the village was in existence, was considered the water superintendent. Uh, he actually had his own business, but he would be the one that would install the water meters and, and do some troubleshooting. But he was not a salaried employee. Uh, he was paid by the, you know, he apparently put in a bill say, I worked three hours yesterday or something, and, and that was how he would get paid. But um, his son, uh, uh, John Hill, is the father of uh, Don Hill Fleury, if you know Don Hill Fleury, and uh, uh, Don's brother, John's son, uh, actually uh, brought this over to me, said they were cleaning some things out of the house. And we're not sure exactly what it was. He said it was some kind of a monitoring panel, he thought that that there was probably a, a telephone line that connected this to either the water tower or maybe the pump house that monitored something, you know, a pump failure, water overflow, water low, something or other. But there was at least a, a little bit of uh, control or monitoring of the, of the system, but that was about it. And in his house. They, there was one spot where they talked about, well, we should get a phone number. <laughs> well, where are we going to put the phone? Okay, who's, who's going to be, want, want to be responsible to have the phone in their house or whatever? I mean, so this was, uh, you know, pretty, pretty low budget operation. And uh, so. You know, you talk about 
talked about um, the expanding water districts and then IBM coming in and expanding the population of Essex Center. Um, do you know anything about at what point they decided to build like Essex Elementary and, and Founders and separate those off from like ADL and Hiawatha? Well, the, the, yeah, of course, that's another, <laughs> you know, talk about confusion, all right, about municipalities and school districts or whatever. You know, back in this time, they had three municipalities. You had the village of Essex Junction, you had the village of Essex Center, and the town of Essex. So if they had a vote on merger or anything like that, it had to be three vote, you know, for three different entities. Schools, a little bit different story. Uh, the town, of course, never had, I say never, the town had the classical institute. They did not have a high school. And as the classical institute uh, went away, the high school students for Essex uh, would be tuitioned to anywhere they wanted to go and be paid for by the town. Most of them went to Essex Junction. Lawton School was the middle school for Essex Junction. Uh, ADL was the middle school for Essex Town because Essex Junction had a separate uh, school district, they call themselves the Prudential Committee, uh, and then uh, Essex Town had their own school uh, superintendent. So uh, another bit of confusion for, uh, particularly anybody moving into the area, you know, uh, where do I have kids go to school? Well, they go to a high school in Essex Junction, right, right? Yeah, so, yeah. It so. was all one school district, though, in the 1950s, it was Chittenden Central for Western was Essex Junction included as 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 they, um, uh, yeah, at one point they would have their annual meetings, they would meet at the, the Essex Middle School. The, again, they used to, the village uh, used to have their meetings here, but then uh, once the uh, middle school was built, then uh, they started having their meetings there. Once a year, they would have an annual meeting, probably get, you know, 20 people show up maybe, uh, except when they, when they did have uh, those votes uh, and then uh, there was a couple times when uh, there was the more talk about fire departments, planning commissions, that kind of thing. They get a little more turnout. They did. Uh, they had a committee that would that studied whether to have a fire department or not, uh, and they they looked into it and they said, uh, better to have a, maybe an independent fire department, okay, not necessarily uh, a run by the municipality of Essex Center, uh, but. That didn't come to be. Uh, ultimately, uh, the town established the fire department uh, with its uh, station on, on Sand Hill Road. So. And, and when you were showing one of your maps, you mentioned Birchwood Manor. Um, like it, it was a big deal in terms of the outlines of um, Essex Center, and I was just wondering what in particular was so important about that development. That development is where I grew up. Yeah, this, this, this map right here, when you're refer referring to maybe, and this is, yep, and this is Birchwood. Because what I think is what's so significant about it is because it's quite large compared to some of the other areas where, if you recall the, the, uh, the aerial photo before, I mean, that there was, well, it was all woods. <laughs> so, so this was a, this was a very sizable development and, and planned and, and built fairly aggressively. Uh, you know, not, not to diminish, you know, these other developments. Uh, here's Maple Lawn Drive, you know, uh, uh, Margaret Street area, uh, you know, and the growth along Foster Road, Lamel area over here. But as far as, you know, size of development, uh, uh, Birchwood would, is probably the, the largest at the time in the area. Uh, I'm not sure how it would compare now to Meadows Edge or doesn't matter. 
So you're saying in 1968 it was the largest, or in 2015, or? Oh, no, I, I'm saying like in 2015, you know, at this, it, it was one of the more, uh, like I say, larger and aggressively built out yeah. uh, so developments. <coughs> funny story, I was, when I still lived in the area, I was being transported by the Essex senior bus at one point because they had a, a wheelchair lift and I told somebody that I lived in Birchwood Manor and the, the other people on the bus were very impressed. They were like, whoa, are you rich? <laughs> because they thought I meant like a huge building and I was like, no. So what'd said, you tell them? <laughs> I said, no, it's in neighbor, my neighborhood, see? Yeah. Yeah. And like every street's a dead end except yeah. for one. Yeah. Yeah, that, and again, that's, that, that's an example of a place name. You know, like I say, you know, Birchwood Manor is a place name. Countryside is a place name. Pinewood Manor is a place name. Essex Center is a place name. Painesville. Pains, Painesville Manor, yeah, yeah, Essex Junction. They were Hubbles Falls, Painesville, Essex Junction, the village of Essex Junction, now the city of Essex Junction. So they, they've, they've kind of hit the trifecta or whatever. In around 1920, before my time, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, before my time. So no, I I I don't know. I'm I'm not aware of that. Yeah, could uh, could be. Well, well, Dick Allen has done a nice piece about. That that uh, that watershed over there, and uh, it, it was I think one of the things about it is it was a big sand area and they planted these trees and it was amazing how much it, it produced these these ponds and made made water there. So. Uh, I'm sorry. Say again. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and good soils, okay? South of Route 15, it's a sand bank, okay? So you got good percolation for, for septic systems and so on with a water system. Yeah, that, uh, that was the, and like I say, you know, they were excited initially. Bring them on, we're, we're excited for growth and so on. And, uh, 1949 was when the village was established, but you know, 1957 into the 60s, once IBM got here, they were the big trigger uh, for uh, most of the most of this this expanded growth. There were wells. <coughs> uh, I've talked to a few different people around uh, that own properties here. Uh, they've had wells. They filled them in and so on. Uh, uh, Tom Taylor lives right over here. I don't know if you know where the uh, public works building is. And Tom Taylor lives right next door to it. Well, he told me there was a well right between his house and, and the public works. This well was like 30 feet deep. And it was dry. And his speculation was that uh, at one point it was, a, it was a producing well. But in 1830, there was this what they called a freshet or what was a flood. And that that wiped out uh, that area. That, that's another story, but Alder Brook used to uh, sweep through Essex Center and then looped around and, and headed back north and dumped into Browns River. In 1830, there was a flood that came through and washed out the road and the dam there, and now it dumps into the Winooski River. And his contention is that at that time, it lowered the water table so far that that w well was no longer uh, product producing. But there were, <clears throat> I've talked to several different folks, uh, a lot of the older houses had cisterns. Uh, if you're familiar with cisterns, but they would collect water uh, from the east spouts and so on uh, and use it for, uh, not for drinking necessarily, but, but for other, other water purposes. Uh, so, you know, combination, uh, shallow wells, uh, deeper wells, cisterns, that's where people were getting the water in.
they remember going across Route 15 to get water. And this is kind of mm -hmm. And Grace Nail used to go down the river over by Brown River. Yep. Um, uh, Jerry Fox has done some research on some of the, the buildings in Essex Center and noted that there was one uh, deed where uh, one of the houses had water rights to a well across the road or whatever, those, those kinds of things where they would share, uh, share water sources. So, uh, yeah, oh yeah, yep, <laughs> I'm sure, I, I mean, my grandparents used to have a water pump in their, in their kitchen. So, yeah. So, you'll be yeah. for people who are interested in seeing old water supplies walking through Saxonville Forest is a great way to, to find them. There are four reservoirs over there. And the right. lowest one, which is down near the end of Sand Hill Road, uh, there's a lot of junk mechanical stuff and pipes and things that still, are still, still hanging in, in there. Existence. And it's, I think they're all spring fed. I don't think there's any stream running through there. Yeah, no, I and think it all originates in, yeah, water. yeah. Yeah, and that, by the way, when the Champlain Water District brought their water line out to Essex Center, <coughs> they actually followed the water line that fed from the woods into Essex Junction. They followed that same right away. And uh, interestingly, uh, one of the first town residents the first town areas to connect to the Champlain Water District was uh, Pinewood Manor because the water line went right near there and Mr. Marcott made a deal with the town and, and uh, got a meter on it or whatever. And so he was actually served by the Champlain Water District before the Champlain Water actually finally got all the way out here to Essex Center. That was like another, another year or two later uh, before they extended way out here. So. Yeah, I, if you know, you see people today, we came through Johnson the other day, there were people lined up there at that cold spring filling their water jugs and so on. You know, uh, yeah, there's uh, places that, and water's a great thing <laughs> if you have it, and it's a terrible thing if you don't. It's a terrible thing if you got too much of it. Well, yeah, that's right. It's like, that's what they say, like, farmers either got dust blowing in your face or in mud up to your knees, so one or the other. But. So anyway, the, the village of Essex Center is no more, but the place, Essex Center, does survive. So. so, Kirby, this is a little thank you for oh. doing this tonight. And we are unveiling our 2023 calendar tonight. Um, if you want to pre-order, uh, it's $15, the same as it was last year. Uh, we have order forms. Uh, we will have them at the annual meeting. You don't have to pre-order tonight. You can get them when we have them, but if you'd like to pre-order, we have some order forms. And you can do that. So. Thank you for coming. <laughs>